All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I would first of all like to thank the organizer of this wonderful meeting for, uh, for inviting me, giving me the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, and then secondly, I would like to thank Christoph for giving a wonderful uh, talk and, uh, and leaving off where I can start. So, of course, Christoph was mentioning all kinds of numbers about differences between mouse and human brain, the number of neurons and all these things. And the topic of my talk is how do we know whether any of these parameters, neuronal parameters, actually matter for mental ability, for, for our thinking, or for the thinking of a mouse. So that's, uh, that's what I want to do, and I, 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 I'm, I do not want to just speculate on it. I really want to show you some experiments that we did to try to relate neuronal properties to mental ability uh, in humans. Okay, but to set the stage and to, to get everybody on the, ra on, the, on the same page, I just want to first talk a little bit about uh, mental, mental ability. What do I mean with that? So yesterday we saw excellent examples, beautiful examples of, uh, of monkeys using all kinds of, of, I mean, of chimps, using all kinds of tools to, uh, to find food and to process food. But there are actually, uh, uh, when you challenge chimps, they can do remarkable things. So for instance, uh, there was this chimp in the 50s. She was called Congo. And she just, just actually painted many paintings. Um, she was known as the Cezanne of the ape world, and she made paintings like these. And, uh, and these, these paintings were actually auctioned. And yesterday evening I was talking to Idan, and he, he told me, yes, I was at this auction where these paintings of Congo were auctioned in London, and they were together auctioned with, uh, with Andy Warhol paintings, but the art collectors all bought paintings by Congo, not by Andy Warhol. The tens of thousands of dollars were paid for, for these paintings. So, so uh, um, chimps can do wonderful things. But of course, mental ability, I mean, Christopher was already saying, um, we think we are so special. Uh, in a way, I mean, uh, that is, of course, we, we all have this fascination uh, with, uh, with our brain and what, we, what it can do. Because human mental ability, of course, I mean, painting like this is not painting a portrait. And to be able to think of projects like these, that's really amazing. So, and the question of today is, of what I want to talk about, is that, that all these parameters, these numbers that Christoph ended with, is that sufficient to explain this kind of, um, well, let's say, a dis a distinction in mental, mental abilities? Is it just brain size or is it a number of neurons? Or are there other properties of neurons that, that may help uh, to explain this? So, of course, I, I, will, uh, I will go through a couple of examples. So, of course, the first question is, do humans have a large brain relative to the body size? This was also mentioned yesterday. Well, when you compare all mammals, or when you put, put them on the, this plot, you see that, uh, that they scale linearly. So, the, the, the bigger the body is, the larger the brain mass is, and they're on a, on a straight line. But when you then, uh, there are actually, there's, uh, in this paper, they talk about the magical 700 gram line. So, there are animals like, uh, like these that, that cannot make it beyond the 700 gram, but there are a couple of animals that can, like the elephants and also the whales that were mentioned. But when you take the, the of course, the human brain is a little bit away from this, uh, from this uh, straight line for the mammals. But when you look at the primate, non-human primate line, it's already a little bit shifted up. And you see, but it's still on a, on a linear, it's still a linear relation between brain mass and body mass. And then when you take the, the hominid line, and you see that, that the human, human brain is nothing special. It's just a linear expansion, just a linear increase of brain mass uh, versus body size. So indeed, uh, Christoph is right. Um, the human brain is nothing special in terms of mass. It's just, uh, we're just on a steeper line of evolution in the hominid uh, uh, clade, but, uh, but still a linear scale. So then yesterday it was also mentioned that the prefrontal cortex is, a, is an evolutionary late structure. And there are um, uh, theories that say that, well, we are we are, our mental ability is, uh, is fed by the fact that we have an exceptionally large prefrontal cortex. So is this true? Do humans have an unexpectedly large frontal cortex? Well, when you <coughs> compare, uh, again, primates, then you see that, that, that humans don't have a very special frontal cortex. When you scale frontal cortex um, to the rest, of the frontal cortex to the rest of the brain, then you see that it's just a linear expansion again uh, in, the, in the primate uh, line that uh, a linear expansion of frontal cortex. So this, again, is nothing unexpected. It's just a linear expansion. And then the last thing that Christoph also mentioned is do, we, do humans have more 
neurons in brain areas for thinking. So I mean the cortex. So this is mouse brain, macaque brain, human brain. And here you see the cortical mantle. Do we have more neurons in brain areas for thinking? Unexpectedly more? Well, this is also not true. Because when you plot the, uh, the, the line for the primates, and you see that uh, you, you, you uh, take the mass of the cerebral cortex versus the neurons in the cerebral cortex, and you see that, the, that we are also, again, on a linear scale. So the, also the number of neurons in our cortex is expected in the primate scale. Um, of course, the exception is uh, this, uh, this whale that uh, Christoph also mentioned. There's double the number, more than double the number of neurons in the cortex. But, uh, but for all these scales, you can find exceptions that are larger than humans. So all in all, uh, linear increases of neurons in the cortex. So the, all, these, all these things, all these growth, brain anatomy uh, scales scale linearly across primate species. So is that, to coming back to the question, is that sufficient to explain differences in mental ability? And Christopher was mentioning that, that there are many neuronal properties in mouse and human neurons that uh, are very similar, but we, we have no clue at this point whether any of these parameters, like dendrites or, uh, or, or um, uh, action potentials, whether they relate to mental ability. So the question of my talk or the, the, that I want to address is, do properties of neurons and synapses make a difference for human cognition? And I'm going to split that up in two sub-questions. First, I'm going to talk about properties of human neurons and synapses and whether they are different between mouse and humans. Uh, and secondly, do any of these cellular properties relate to mental ability in humans? Because ultimately, if we want to know what kind of factors matters for, matter for differences between uh, other animal species and us, then we need to know which, which of these cellular parameters relate to mental ability and which don't. Then we can actually uh, say something about it about the comparison. So do cellular properties differ among species? So I have a similar, uh, similar analogy as, uh, as Christoph. So when you look at the, uh, at, the, at the cortex, for instance, and you look at the, uh, the, the, grow, the anatomy, the cellular anatomy of the cortex, then things look very, diff very uh, similar across the different species. You see that there are more layers in neurons, and maybe parameter neurons are bigger, but in general, the shape is the same. But the question is, um, is not so much, uh, is, do we have fundamental differences, differences in kind? But the question is, how big is the degree in differences that we can find between uh, neurons, pyramidal neurons in humans and, and uh, mice, for instance? So it, to, call, to also show this kind of analogy, this, this, these kinds of circuitries, are the elements, are they more efficient? Are they more, can they process more information per resistor, let's say? Or, uh, or, or are the resistors by themselves the same? It's just that you have more of those put in a small space uh, than, than, um, than in, the, in the other species, as Christopher was also pointing out. So the first thing that we did is uh, we looked at human neur um, neuronal uh, morphology. So we used the same kind of surgical specimens as uh, Christoph was mentioning. And we find indeed that, uh, that as Christoph was, Christoph was saying, that these human pyramidal neurons, they're about three times as large in layer 2-3 as mouse pyramidal neurons. Surprisingly, we used uh, the, the neuromorpho.org database of uh, Giorgio Ascoli, uh, to, where we found also some macaque neurons that were, were in from the temporal cortex that were reconstructed in the very same way as we do. Uh, and these ne pyramidal neurons from adult, adult macaques were very similar to the mouse. Javier de Filippe in the, pre in the past had already uh, pointed out that uh, when you count the number of synapses per pyramidal neuron in, uh, in the human uh, cortex versus, and you compare it to the rat and the mouse cortex, and human pyramidal neurons, especially in layer 2, 3, receive about double the amount of synapses. Uh, and also when you average it over the entire cortex, then on, in, on average, pyramidal neurons in human cortex re receive many more synapses, about double uh, the amount. So that means that, the, uh, that these, these large neurons, they integrate much more synaptic information. So this, uh, this difference in, in, uh, in neuron size does not only exist between uh, mouse and, and humans, but actually it's a gradient that you can find across all the, uh, the primate species. So um, Elston and Manger, they both have, uh, have uh, um, reconstructed post-mortem material, dendrites, basal dendrites from, uh, from all these species, and, uh, and compared them. And what you see here in the bars is the number of spines per pyramidal neuron, so let's say the number of structures where excitatory synapses are received. 
uh, you see that it also differs across species. It also differs across brain areas. So visual cortex is particularly an area where neurons don't seem to differ much across species. But as, as soon as you go to association areas, like the temporal cortex or the, pre, or the prefrontal cortex, then the number of spines per neuron uh, is very different. It's very large in humans and uh, as a gradient across species. But also when you look at the, uh, the neuronal complexity in the different species, uh, then you see that, the, uh, that for each of these brain areas, the prefrontal cortex in red, visual cortex in blue, that the, the neuronal complexity increases with increasing brain mass. So on this side, the Galago, uh, you see that they have, in general, in all brain areas, smaller neurons, less complex neurons than in, in human. Okay, so uh, what about um, uh, human synapses? So I told you already, the, these large neurons, they receive many more synapses. What about the properties of these synapses? So we've uh, recorded from, uh, from synaptically connected neurons in the human cortex, stimulated one, the presynaptic neuron, and then recorded the postsynaptic response. And I will make, just make it short. What we found is that human synapses, they recover from this synaptic depression much faster than mouse synapses. And as a consequence, uh, the, the, when you repeatedly, when neurons are repeatedly active, synapses can transmit much more information in human neurons, single synapses, so the information rate between two neurons is much higher in human synapses just because they can recover much faster from depression. Only this factor um, already gives rise to a, a very big difference in information rate between two neurons. So when a, a pyramidal neuron receives many more inputs and they can also transmit much more information, then the question is, can human pyramidal neurons actually encode? higher information content. So when, uh, uh, when you look in rodents, Carl Peterson's lab has made recordings in awake rodents, then what you see is that when you record the membrane potential, then you see that there's a bombardment of, uh, of uh, synaptic uh, inputs to this, mem uh, to this membrane, and there's a lot of information coming in, but the neuron only fires every now and then, and doesn't fire at every synaptic input, but only fires every now and then as if it's, 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 it's transmitting some information, but others not. And the question now is, how much of this rich, high-frequency content of information can a neuron actually pass on? So we've done experiments in manipulating uh, membrane potentials with known frequencies to calculate how much of these frequencies can actually be encoded in actual potential timing. And what we find is that for rodent neurons, this was already published by uh, Michele Giuliano, the, the, the frequency content up to 200 hertz can be encoded in extra potential timing, and then, but then it falls off rapidly. But for human neurons, this goes on to 1,000 hertz, and it can even go further. Some neurons we recorded, we, we tried 1,500 hertz. The neurons can still encode this in extra potential timing, which means that uh, these human neurons, they can encode a richer um, frequency content or more synaptic information into extra potential timing. So how can they do that? And that's because uh, human neurons can maintain a faster action potential, uh, action potential kinetics than mouse neurons can. What you see here are action potentials at different instantaneous frequencies in color code between human and mouse neurons. And you can see in the derivative that the, uh, that the action potential slows down much more in mouse neurons with higher frequencies than it does in, in human neurons. And that's, uh, uh, this is quantified here. And, uh, and you see that with a single action potential, there's not so much difference. So it means that human neurons and mouse neurons, they make similar action potentials. They're not different in kind, they're different in degree, but, the, um, but the, they slow down much more in mouse neurons than in human neurons. Okay, so that means that, that of course, when you look at a, at a glance at human neurons or at the human brain from a distance, you, you make all the statistics, the calculations, may even maybe even the molecular content, then at first glance, it looks very similar. But when you start to drive the system, you start to, you start to push it a little bit, then you find that there are dynamical differences that, uh, that, that pop out and that are related to information processing and information transfer that are different in human neurons than in mouse neurons. So these are small differences, but they can make a big difference because the number of neurons and the number of synapses in our brain is so much higher, and you would have to multiply by, by these differences so that you can, that the computational power of the entire brain increases much more uh, than just based on the number of neurons it, if, you have, if you take these cellular properties into account. But of course, the important question is, does any of this matter for mental ability in humans? 
Now, so as Christoph was mentioning, we get, uh, we get tissue uh, from surgical theater from, from epilepsy and tumor patients, and, and we take that to the lab and record from these uh, neurons. But actually, these patients, they go through a whole battery of testing in the hospital. So they, they, they go in the MRI, of course. They have, the, the, the surgeon wants to decide which part of the brain he needs to cut out. They go through clinical neurophysiology. The EEGs are recorded, intracranial EEG, often also depth electrodes are implanted. They go through all kinds of cognitive tests because the, the medical psychologist wants to know how much the surgery is going to affect the function of the patients and whether they're going to recover. Um, and of course, we get all kinds of cellular data and then we can, we can do modeling. So we have, let's say, a very rich multimodal data set of the same, very same person from ranging from the neurons to cognition. So we can actually do something with that data. And, and especially since the, the region that we get tissue from is the medial uh, temporal gyrus. And it has been associated, the thickness of the medial temporal gyrus has been associated with intelligence, with mental ability, cognitive ability. And this is in, in these kind of papers, what people do is they, in healthy subjects, scan hundreds of them and, and take their IQ scores. And then what they find is that temporal association areas, but also prefrontal areas, they positively correlate, the thickness of the cortex positively correlates with IQ. And... Uh, uh, Mr. Deary has, uh, has uh, put this in a nice review in Nature, nature uh, Reviews. And area 21 is medial temporal gyrus. Uh, the thickness of that area correlates with uh, IQ scores. So the first question that we addressed was, well, in our patients, does the thickness of the temporal cortex also associate with IQ scores? So we get the MRIs and measure the cortical thickness, Natalia did, and, uh, um, and see if the, if the temporal lobe on average, the temporal uh, uh, cortex associates, correlates with IQ. And what we find is that indeed when you take the IQ scores of all the, of all the patients and measure their cortical thickness uh, of the temporal cortex, then you find a, we find a positive correlation very similar to what has been reported for the healthy subjects in, uh, 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 by the other papers. So also in our patients, temporal cortical thickness correlates with, uh, with IQ. So if a cortex is thicker, that means that there's more room for large dendrites. So uh, the next question that we have is, uh, so if does thicker, thicker cortex also mean larger dendrites of pyramidal neurons? And this also holds true. So from the very same patients, we have uh, a couple of reconstructions of their, of their entire reconstructions of their full dendrites. And uh, we measure the total dendritic length and plot that against the cortical thickness of, that very, of the temporal cortex of the very same patient and we find indeed also a very strong positive correlation between cortical thickness and uh, dendritic length. So then the next question is, does dendritic length associate with intelligence? So that's also true. So we plot dendritic length against the IQ score of the same patients, and we find a, a strong positive correlation, not only for the length of the total length of the dendrite, but also for the complexity, so the number of branch points of these dendrites. We find a positive, so strong positive correlations uh, with IQ, meaning that people with high IQ, they tend to have larger neurons and more complex neurons. So, as I was saying, when we compared the pyramidal neurons between mouse and humans, we found that the, uh, that, that the humans have larger neurons, uh, more, more complex also, and that they have physiological properties uh, that are different. They can track frequencies in the membrane potential changes much better. And uh, what we did in collaboration with, uh, with Idan, but also with Michele Giuliano in Antwerp, is we used these actual morphologies of these neurons uh, in a model simulation. Uh, so these are small neurons, or little dendrite. We've we scaled them to the same size for the, for the display, but you see here the numbers is the total dendritic length. Um, and uh, then looked at their frequency response, so basically how well can they encode frequencies in their action potential output. And what you see is that the that the, the morphology of the cell itself is a direct determinant of how well a neuron can track frequencies. So larger neurons can track frequencies much better, can encode frequency, sub, uh, 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 fine scale temporal information in the membrane potential changes much better than small neurons. So you see also a positive correlation between the total dendritic length and what you call the cutoff frequency, so where the, the 3 dB uh, reduction of this is, 
cutoff frequency, so shifts to higher neurons, so bigger neurons can encode more frequencies. And also, again, uh, they have a faster action potential. So larger neurons, they have faster action potentials than smaller neurons. So then the next question, of course, is uh, does cellular function or do action potentials actually relate to human cognitive ability? You can imagine that then when neurons are fast, when they can trans keep fast action potentials, can encode high frequency information in uh, action potential output, that you can imagine that the information processing is much more efficient in those uh, humans than in, in uh, humans with neurons that cannot do that. So that's why we wanted to know, would this action potential kinetics relate to IQ scores? So for that, to that end, what we did is we, we recorded many action potentials from many cells and measured uh, different parameters and then put everything in one uh, big uh, test, comparing low IQ versus high IQ patients. And, what we f and this is what we find. So the first action potential by itself uh, is not so different between, uh, between low IQ and high IQ patients. But as soon as the neurons start to fire repeatedly, so at low frequencies or at higher frequencies, then we see that uh, at patients with low IQs, the action potential slows down much more than in patients with high IQs. So you see the kinetics of action potentials at 40 hertz are very different between the, between the patients with different IQ scores. And also when you plot the correlation, IQ score versus relative speed at, uh, at repeated firing, you see that there's a strong positive correlation where the action potential shape actually predicts the IQ score. So in summary, uh, neuronal complexity and action potential speed predicts IQ. The temporal cortical thickness predicts IQ scores, so the thicker the cortex, the higher the IQ scores. Um, dendritic length and complexity associated with IQ. A fast action potentials, uh, I didn't show the threshold, but that also associates with the high IQ. And um, the, the, the big conclusion then is that large complex neurons can encode more information. Now, to, so now that we know a couple of neuronal parameters that actually matter for mental ability, so com big, large complex neurons uh, and, and being able to have fast action potentials associate with, uh, with intelligence, which means that if you take uh, uh, um, uh, Christoph's numbers, uh, of uh, uh, 86 billion, then it's just not a, a factor of 1,000 difference. It's a factor of 1,000 difference in the number of neurons. But when the neurons are also more efficient and encode more information, then you actually need to take that into account of well, as well. And the synapses uh, the, the are more efficient in transmitting information. And then, of course, we can, uh, let's say, get a much bigger um, difference between species than just based on the numbers. Also, the function differs. So, to put that in, an, uh, in, uh, in words first, so there's a linear scaling at the level of the brain. We have an increase of brain per body mass, um, expansion of frontal areas, and more neurons in brain and cortex. These are linearly scaled between the species. But with faster neuronal and synaptic properties, we have large dendrites, more synapses per neuron, more information per synapse, and faster action potentials. You actually need to multiply that by, by a lot of neurons and a lot of synapses so that the computational power increases much more than you would expect just based on linear scaling of neurons number. So to put that in a visual way, so here I plot the primate species, and here I put mental ability just in arbitrary units. And so the linear scaling of brain anatomy, uh, so increase in brain size results in increase in mental ability. Uh, frontal cortex expansion, more neurons, probably also uh, lift, shift this line upward. But then when you start to take into account that the, the components, the building blocks of the brain also differ in function, then actually this, la this, la this line starts to tilt because you have to multiply by, by the neurons and by the synapses. So encoding at high bandwidth, uh, faster action potentials, more information per synapse, more synapses per neuron, dendritic size, they push this line upward. So maybe the, the huge divide that we see in mental ability is just the result of linear evolution at the linear expansion of uh, brain anatomy, but also linear evolution of cell properties. And together, they explode this mental scale into the difference that we observe today. So I agree with Christoph. We are not a different, uh, we're not a different in kind. We're not a different kind of, uh, let's say, uh, entity on this planet. No, we're just another animal. But just because we have linear evolution at multiple scales, not only on the, on the gross anatomy, but also on the cellular level, pushed uh, 
uh, mental ability uh, through the roof, let's say like that. So to come back to Idan's question, so what makes us human? I think that Idan knew the answer already years ago, and that's why he put all these dendrites on the building, because that is what makes us human, dendrites that process much more information. So I thank these, all my collaborators and funders, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So, of course, uh, so the heritability of, uh, of IQ is, is very high, especially when you look at the 40-year-old or older, then the heritability scores go are 50 between 80% of the variance in the, in the population is explained by genetics. Um, but that doesn't mean, of course, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, let's say, environment is completely ruled out. And I think that, uh, that if you remove uh, people from the enriched environment they grow up in today, uh, that, that you would have dramatic effects. So, yeah. so the, these are, of course, very important uh, 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 points and difficult to answer. But um, of course, we know that uh, synaptic uh, that uh, cortical circuits are shaped by experience a lot. We went to this concert last night. Uh, this whole violinists. You know that if you if you scan uh, violinists um, that have practiced for ten years vigorously that their sensory cortex is very different. The, the areas that, that take care of the fingers uh, is increased much more. So experience is very important, but you need to do a lot uh, to, uh, to change the connectivity. So. I, Philip has a question too, sorry. I already pointed to him. Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah, and that's a good point. So, uh, so this is this is a comparison. So we we comp we did the recordings for the mouse and the humans ourselves, and did the reconstructions ourselves, and the macaque we, neurons we took from the from the um, uh, neuromorphological database. So there could be a methodological difference. Um, Elston compared postmortem um, complexity of basal dendrites. Uh, in his own lab, and he finds that there are that there are uh, gradual differences between the species. Uh, so I think that that we would have to do the experiments ourselves to really um, make the hard number out of that. But it's so hard to get um, uh, live macaque tissue in the lab to really do the experiment. Um, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I very much like the relationship between the computational power and size of the neuron. And I wonder whether this applies to differences between the large pyramidal cells in layer five and smaller pyramidal cells in layer three and two. Do you know something about that? Yeah, so we also work on layer five in human, human neurons. And, uh, and actually, so the layer five neurons, they are large. I mean, the dendrite extends uh, across all layers, but they, they don't have so many side branches. So the, these layer two, three neurons, they have large total dendritic length because they, they expand, they, they a lot of uh, bifurcations, and the layer five neurons are, are all have the same similar length in total when you ca accumulate everything, but it's just uh, less branched off. But they, they have very different properties also. So they, uh, when you compare uh, uh, the oblique dendrites, they can generate action potentials themselves, uh, whereas in, in mouse neurons you never see that that they can do that. So they're so much more. They can these dendrites so the, can the, process the, the, si the size difference doesn't hold between layer five and layer right. three? No, layer two, three, is, it has similar large, layer three especially has similarly large neurons as in layer five, yeah. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit how you do the statistical analysis when you make repeated measurements of multiple neurons on the same person. So for the, uh, <clears throat> For the, the physiology, IQs, the correlations, for example. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's really important. So we do take multiple, multiple testing into account. Uh, we try to, of course. Uh, so we we never screen for anything, uh, uh, except for the last thing that I showed, the extra potential. There we did put in uh, uh, the kinetic parameters of the extra potentials, um, and then did one uh, uh, manova on that, to uh, and of the two groups, low IQ, high IQ. 
So then we uh, d did one big test, and that's and then a post hoc test to uh, to, to see how the uh, which of the parameters were actually different. For the correlations, so we, we go hypothesis by hypothesis. So biological hypothesis by biological hypothesis. So the, um, we never do a screening. Uh, we just, well, based on cortical thickness, we hypothesize that the dendrites is a logical uh, hypothesis. Just do one test, just the dendrite correlate with, uh, with the cortical thickness. And then, uh, of course, we take into account uh, that, that we then next uh, um, test whether dendrites correlate with IQ. But it's a different test, uh, there's a different hypothesis altogether. Yeah, I was so thinking about the correlations between multiple neurons on the same person. They're not ah, independent. Right. right, exactly. So right now we've taken the very simplistic approach to just, uh, for each patient, average uh, the total dendritic length and use one number as total dendritic length for, uh, for the correlation. Indeed, you're right, there could be nested uh, effects, so uh, that, that the that they, uh, that they are not independent, but right now we didn't uh, do any statistical modeling to look into the details of that. Okay, thanks. All right. Thank you very much.